ladies and gentlemen, maybe we could <laughs> try to start. No, 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 maybe no, some people happy. want to move to your chairs. Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really a great pleasure. My name's uh, Roland Danreuter, and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Social Science and Humanities within which the School of Law uh, resides. And it is really one of my favourite things, really, to, to launch books or to have a book launch. Um, I think we all know why we're here. Uh, he's not actually up on this table. But somewhere in the audience there is uh, Andreas. Um, and it is a really celebration uh, of the publication uh, of his book, uh, Spatial Justice, Body, Lawscape and Atmosphere. And I particularly like these events because I think in a way it's, a, it's an opportunity after these many years of intellectual, personal struggle that takes place to produce these books. Um, uh, and there's always a danger then that that book just goes out into the world uh, without having a more sort of uh, personal encounter uh, between the author and the readers. Um, and I'm sure you've all have read it or are about to read it or are purchasing the book at the end. Um, but it is an opportunity, I think, for, for, for that encounter. And uh, Andreas is with us and we have a number of people uh, who are going to present their own particular perspectives uh, uh, on uh, Andreas's um, work uh, and on uh, this particular book. Just to remind you who uh, Andreas is, I'll only remember for each one, but Philippopoulos Mihalopoulos uh, is Professor uh, of uh, Law and Theory at the University of Westminster and founder co-director um, of the Westminster Law and Theory Centre. And he's also editor, and apparently this is also being launched today, with Christian Bork of the Reitkledge Glass House series, Space, Materiality and the Normative. Uh, Spatial Justice is actually um, um, Andreas' uh, seventh book, um, his third monograph, and he's well known previously for having written uh, his earlier monograph on Nicholas Luhmann, uh, and then earlier in 2008 on Absent Environments, um, Theorizing Environmental Law, and the city. And uh, as you all will know, uh, Andreas has had a very wide interdisciplinary approach to the study of law and theory. Uh, and this book is very much a celebration uh, of that. And in that context, we have three um, uh, interveners, um, presenters, um, commentators uh, upon uh, the work of, of Nicholas, who come um, of, of Andreas. Uh, who come from various uh, backgrounds and various parts of the university and outside of the university. We're going to start with uh, Professor Lindsay Bremner, who is Professor in the Faculty of Architecture and Built Environment and Director of Architectural Research uh, at Westminster. And she's also an award-winning architect uh, and writer. And her main research projects are Folded Ocean and Geoarchitecture, investigating how the Indian Ocean is transformed by global mobility, transnationalism, and climate change. We'll then move to, uh, move to P P Peter Fitzpatrick, uh, who is uh, anniversary professor of law at Birkbeck, an honorary professor of law at the University of Kent. Research interests include political and legal theory, law and imperialism, including current global forms of imperialism and indigenous rights, and latest books include with Ben Gorder, Foucault's Law, and Law as Resistance, Modernism, Imperialism, and Legalism. And then our third uh, um, um, contribution will be from uh, Anne Bottomley, who is a reader in law at the University of Kent. And her research interests include property practices in relation to urban planning uh, and architecture, drawing from Deleuze, anthropology, social theory, and feminism. So I think we've got a pretty wide coverage uh, amongst our three speakers. And at this point, I'll probably pass on uh, to Lindsay to start the ball rolling. Thanks very much, Roland. I suppose A is for architecture, so that's why I come first. Um, but it's a real honor to be um, here this evening amongst such an erudite panel, and I hope I won't let the spatial discipline down. Um, this might sound like a truism, but Andreas is someone who makes sense of the world spatially. His book is populated by spaces and scapes and spatial tropes, images, and metaphors. Inside, outside, rupture, crack, position, placement, surface, tilt, flow, confluence, withdrawal. These words and his way of writing use language as prompts to call up a spatial imaginary, 
through which he builds his argument. This is what makes his books, for me as an architect, another person who thinks spatially, so beguiling and so compelling, if difficult to read. I will just give you one example, the opening paragraph of this new book, in which the book's central thesis is cast entirely in spatial terms. And I, I just want to read this as a quote. There is no outside, but we need an outside. This is the cry of this book. The cry is spatialized, legalized, rarefied, embodied, ruptured, dissimulated. But underneath all this, it remains a cry. A particularly, particularly echoing one, too. In the box of the Anthropocene, where humans are both everywhere and decentralized, and in which all material bodies are clustered, breathing space is limited, future is closing in. Human extinction is a possible reality. One stands on one's toes and looks for an outside. Andreas's book is about looking for an outside, a way out, where there is no way out, no outside. There is only the possibility of reorienting the inside, turning it inside out or outside in, in ways that enable bodies, not only human ones, to fit better with each other. <clears throat> this is Andreas's idea of spatial justice. It emerges when bodies withdraw and the outside is given some space. When some of the inside is turned into an outside and legal space is oriented orientated differently. This reminds me of a powerful work <clears throat> by video artist Bill Viola, titled Ocean Without a Shore, first shown at the Venice Biennale in 2007, which I saw in a Spanish Civil War bunker in a stone quarry in Lleida, Spain last year, itself a very inside, outsideless space. Some of you might know this work. In the video, a woman advances very slowly towards the camera in black and white. As she moves, she passes without pausing through a curtain of falling water, which is invisible until it falls onto her body. As she does so, the video switches into color and her dress turns bright red. Once through the water, she pauses and looks for a long while straight ahead at the camera before turning and withdrawing back through the water curtain into her monochrome world. In this video, the sheet of water provides a rupture in the continuity of a deep, dark space. However, it is only through the movement of the woman's body that this border is made visible. Her body ruptures its invisible surface and divides an inside from an outside. Having passed through and dwelled in the outside for a while, gazing it into its unknown void, she withdraws back from it. She retreats and the outside vanishes. It disappears. For me, this was a visceral portrait of a world without an outside and the abilities of bodies to rupture the continuity of space and turn some of the inside into an outside by withdrawing from it. Thank you. Well, Lindsay, thank you very much. Um, in one of the uh, general invitations to this event, uh, Andreas revealed that uh, this book took a few chunks out of my soul. Uh, I was relieved to discern that there's still ample left. Um, and then I sort of wondered, you know, what was the return to these chunks of salt, apart from the consumption of an inordinate amount of chocolate? Um, and what we find, I would like to suggest in summary, is a work ensouled with a vast and enjoyable erudition, uh, a work that will prove to be expansive and enduring significance. Now that's enough in the laudatory vein, really. Um, or at least for now, I'll, I'll come back to it. Um, in any case, uh, difficult to 
to pass the blurbs on the back of this book. <laughs> I mean, cumulatively, cumulatively, um, sorry, I'm just, <laughs> cumulatively, they um, sort of indicate that it's the best thing since um, Gutenberg made that, <laughs> made this possible. And in any case, I think an occasional critical inquiry does lend plausibility to praise. So I'm going to indulge in a little bit of uh, critical inquiry. So, and there are a lot of quotes from, from Andrews's book. Uh, I won't always say that they're quotes in the hope that his wonderful phraseology will be attributed to me. Uh, and let's see how we go. So the focus throughout in the book is called the lawscape. And we are told that, and obviously I'm quoting now, the lawscape itself determines its invisibilization depending upon its self-perpetuating um, needs. Now, whilst not disagreeing with this or its underlying uh, materiality, uh, my question concerns how may it be that we, ha you know, how could this be achieved, this, this determination within and as the lawscape. And I'm just going straight back now, you know, sharing this with, with, with Lindsay, with the, with, with the Nietzsche, and the, the, the epigraph to the whole book is from Zarathustra, and it reads like this. There is an, uh, sorry, almost got that totally wrong. There is no outside, but we forget this, how lovely it is that we forget. Now, that quote's preceded in Zarathustra with the following. For me, how could there be something outside of me? And that's pretty well the Nietzschean question, if you like. So if this of me, it's of me that there is no outside, broadly my question would be, what is the place, if you like, of the Nietzschean me in, in the lawscape? Scaled down with an apt modesty, I have to say, my question would be whether what I will now outline fits into the book's focal uh, orientation. And you could then put it in terms of the book, what is the part of the, um, um, the, the sensitized, uh, the sensitized me, uh, the epistemological situatedness, I'm not claiming that one, that's Andreas, the epistemological situatedness in and as the lawscape. And the brief answer may be you've completely missed the point, but let's see, if, uh, let's see if this fits together. I hope it does. Okay, the hope uh, that I've not completely missed the point comes from what for me was one of the most affecting uh, parts of the book, uh, a section called Walking the Lawscape. And this walking entails students in Andreas's course called Law of the Environment walking, walking singly it seems, in London uh, in ways conducive to experiencing what he would call the legal atmosphere, a sense of generating a sensitivity to the effective presence uh, of the law. Uh, with the students, and again I'm quoting obviously, fully immersing themselves in a performativity that involves again a pushing of their limits, an awareness enhanced, uh, and, and, and there's some preliminary reading uh, of some literature, uh, including Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus. As soon as I read that, I thought that might spread alarm among the students initially, because they'd be wondering what sort of scale this walk is going to be. Uh, if they're, <laughs> if, but anyway. So reassurance, anyway, reassurance would come uh, with a handout that, um, which Andres once actually kindly sent to me, uh, a handout that uh, proceeds, even accompanies this, what he calls sensorial ambling, a handout which asks questions uh, evoking an attuned uh, responsiveness, if you like, to the law. For example, uh, questions to do with um, changes in bodily movement, uh, the contents of thought, feelings of constraint, questions to do with perception, smell, um, touch, uh, <laughs> looking upwards, um, which I think is wonderful because you know, people, when you see them 
sort of doing the uh, driven walk from A to B. There's not much looking upwards. Um, so locating themselves in short and, and, and the law within a generative spatiality. Now, crucially, at least crucially, I think or hope, crucially, Andreas observes that all this allows, and this is a quote, the students to feel as if they are no longer the self-contained, fully determined human body, but part of an assemblage which, however, keeps on withdrawing. And then he notes with sustained emphasis, and this is all in italics, this bit, the space of law's spatial turn, the space of law's spatial turn is non-Euclidean, non-measurable, non-directional, non-unitary, non-linear, and non-metaphorical. Uh, He's down on metaphors in this particular book. Um, or returning to the walking, all students, says Andreas, uh, all students realize very quickly that the law is everywhere. The law is everywhere. Or as he puts it in the context of the purport of the book as a whole, we have um, a non-essentialized law that, I'm quoting, emerges everywhere. And from his reading of Michel uh, Tournier's novel Vendredi, we have uh, a rewriting of, uh, which is a rewriting of Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. Uh, Andreas, Andreas uh, extracts, in his terms, a lawscape that keeps on becoming or reoriented by the various bodies populating, uh, populating the island. Now, what I wonder, and this is almost finally, what I wonder is whether or how this generative irresolution between the determined law that we started out with, determined in and as part of the lawscape, and the law that is illimitable, the law that's illimitably, incipiently everywhere, whether this can be taken upon, uh, sorry, taken beyond this ominous constraint that tends to typify the law as the students uh, perceive it. Uh, even as so constrained, even as seeing law in, in these constrained terms, it could also be cast somewhat more positively. I'm thinking, for example, of Coleridge saying, um, you know, and I think he would perhaps say this has something to do with law. I'm mumbling because I couldn't find the source. Um, that, uh, you know, it's um, each morning we venture out, each morning we don't think we're walking among lions. Uh, w whether that's an illusion or not, a partial illusion, at least uh, the law does have something to do with providing us with that. But what I'm suggesting um, uh, further, um, and here I'm not in, in engaging in that aggravating academic habit of saying this is what he should have said. Um, if we take it further, a law that is everywhere, incapable of being essentialized, or as Blanchot might be forced to say, an unavowable law, um, what is there to distinguish it from what goes to constitute it? Uh, goes to constitute it, and I'm stealing words from other contexts but in Andres's book, but I think it fits indistinguishably uh, or in an indistinction. Um, these are emphatic uses, or empathetic uses, I hope, that, that, that fit the law. So Andreas can render law as a heady mix, including geography, history, psychology, chemistry, physics, economics, the media, religion, and so on. So let me take, not quite randomly, uh, and finally, finally now, promise, uh, the, the, the last, that is religion. And I'll just squeeze in Derrida's and Fracture's text on faith and knowledge, where he fuses the constituent imperatives of religion, faith, belief, promise, uh, with the like imperatives which you would find in law and find in various other locations, including uh, language and uh, much else indeed. And might we then ask, whether it's the case that Andreas takes us towards an opening to the rescue of law, to the rescue of law, from its bestowed dependence on malign powers, 
or its abject import generally, or rescues us from its marginalized um, significance. An opening that he provides us to the situated realization of law in its fullness. Law in and as our being together. And thence law as a deeply performative, demotic, and ultimately revolutionary taking the force of law in and as ourselves. Thank you. Using one very familiar temporal measurement, a year ago, Andreas and I were both part of a compressed process of interfolding temporally, spatially, imaginatively, and intellectually into a symposium entitled Spaces of Justice. The symposium, which was created by, curated by Chris Butler and Ed Mazawir, was held on a small island just off the Brisbane coast in a resort rather wonderfully called World Watch Point. In the preface to the book we're gathered together to celebrate today, Andreas refers to that symposium as a time of being inebriated with the way in which ideas were exploding before us. That time, place, that event, returned to me very strongly when I read and reread Andreas's wonderful book over the past few weeks. Hearing again the sounds of the sea, recalling the taste of salt on my mouth, feeling the warmth of the air and the tars under my feet as if now, that strength of the sense to a pleasure of recall, what I'm listening to, focusing on, is Andreas reading his paper, drawing from Deleuze's essay on, and later used as a preface to, Tonier's Bondry, with self-reworking, initially in the mood of reversal, of Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. Andreas carefully unfolds, teases out, extracts and pursues, diagrams and explores a doubling in of islands thereby rendering visible a virtual and intimate, a yet to come of for spatial justice, conjuring, to quote Deleuze, the new upright image in which the elements are released and take possession of themselves again, having become celestial and forming a thousand capricious figures. That paper presented on Stanbrook Island last December is now recast into the concluding chapter of Andreas's book, The Double Island, The Desert Island, is diagrammed as the space in which spatial justice emerges, no longer as spatial justice, but rather as of spatial justice, having become necessarily elemental. A justice beyond land landscape, carved from within rather than sought in an outside, and grounded not in origins, but in beginnings. And as Andreas writes in the final lines of his book, this kind of justice can only be written in texts which repeat themselves on the same island with the same bodies, every time different. It was, of course, so apposite that my first encounter with Andres's work on islands, his pay into the power of islands, was on an island, as he traced his emergent potential for space of justice enacted before and between us, carried in islands, it seemed so much, the right paper, in the right place, at the right time. A moment, an event of splendid synchrony, and even more so on an island which carries so many references to other places and times, other narratives passing through and over and sed sedimented into, written onto, this place of now. Here in the warm south, I was surrounded by the familiar names of tiny East Anglian villages, villages otherwise clustered around the fragile North Sea margins of salt marshes and crumbling cliffs, a folding of spatial temporal coordinates which place the familiar and the strange, the past and the present, in such close proximity and insisted, in this case, on reminding us of the colonial origins of this island, which we were so comfortably, and for those of us at the symposium so briefly, inhabiting. Islands, seas, ships, passages, voyages, embarking and disembarking. I've always loved the way we talk of launching a book, as if a ship to sea. It is certainly a process of casting off, of letting it move out into territories which we cannot control, with imprecise maps waiting for reports of sightings and destinations reached. What carries this particular book, sorry, what makes this book, particular book special for so many of us, I think, is not only the cargo it carries in the sense of content, but more so in that it recalls and traces journeys already accomplished through papers and articles in circulation, 
performances and interruptions. Remembered and Andreas's ever generosity and ever becoming in sharing so transparently and honestly the development of his thinking. This book is as a pattern of series gathered together, folded together, resonating now in between each series, as well as with the already encountered that we've been privileged to share in the process, the enactments of Andreas's thinking. So this book is a threshold in which we are able to re-encounter and re-engage with his work, always as if for the first time, with the memory and knowledge of the repetition. Yes, here it is brought together in such a way as we are able to read through along the body of the work, and that works so well. But there's also so much more here, both in the resonances which, which recall and the excess, the surplus, which points towards the future, of, sorry, the, points towards the work of future excavation and extraction, the promise of future potential. What Andreas has achieved is a very immediate connection with his readership in which he offers himself as a partner in travel, not as a definitive map, but as a warm, careful, and considerate guide who encourages exploration and himself willingly and transparently takes risks, turning to see if we are following him. In a sense, the book is something of an island, as much as of a ship. Whilst it carries in the offer of its reading of a, 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 a well, it, whilst it carries the offer in its reading of a time space to concentrate consolidate and bring together a plethora of material made mobile by the underpinning logic of this being part of a process, a pattern of beginnings rather than endings, it also performs a process of withdrawal in order to engage, of separation in order to combine. We can, we can recall Deleuze when write, in writing of islands, he says, the land that draws humans towards islands extends the double movement that produces islands in themselves. Dreaming of islands, whether with joy or in fear, it doesn't matter, is dreaming of pulling away, of, already being, of being already separate from any continent, of being lost and alone, or it is the dreaming of starting from scratch, recreating, beginning anew. Vanessa Brito writes, the desert that at once separates and relates Moses and Aaron is nothing other than the diagrammatic place where is sketched the place of the missing people. But this missing people precisely is neither a public nor a people of men. There can only be a molecular people, a phosphorescent people made of dancing grains and luminous dust that was already there at the origin of the work of art. The atomic people of the desert island whose dance merges with mythological combats among the elements of nature. The people to come, in fact, is also what was already there because the future is not a historical future, even a utopian one, it's the infant now the none that Plato already distinguished from any present, the intensive or the untimely. Andreas, in this important book, alerts us to the processes by which we can diagram and unearth the potential of the island, and thereby affect and recover a reconfiguration of justice as elemental, unbounded by our conventions in space of time, and constrained by being held within, but rather understood as carved out of the lawscape the island which emerges punching a hole out of the sea. The launching of the book is, I think, an opportunity for us to engage with ideas and practices and to open ourselves to encounters which are a challenge to our conventions and the compass of certainty. What Andreas achieves is to present us with a text that not only gives us direction, but also the reasons for wanting to, needing to pursue. His enthusiasm and energy become ours, are shared with us. Last year, following on from Andreas's paper, I found myself engulfed in images drawn from Shakespeare's The Tempest, and then even more so from the magic proliferation of image and sound in Peter Greenaway's film Prospero's books, in which books unfold into universes and the flight of ethereal creatures traces and stirs currents of air and water. It seemed to me then and now that this was another text, interpretation and performance, which could be used to extract and explore the diagram of Desert Island Double. Here in the magical conjuring, the artifice of the as-if, in the virtue of multiple potentials carried within the island, is, to quote Deleuze and Guattari, a diagrammatic or abstract machine, which is not function to represent something real, but rather constructs a real that is yet to come, a new type of reality. In the catching of glimpses, moments of potential, in stretching to hear the sound, to catch the echo, we record Deleuze's vision, which I have already quoted, of the new upright image, in which the elements are released and take possession of themselves again, having become celestial and forming a thousand capricious figures. And also Brito's molecular people, 
a phosphorescent people made of dancing grains and luminous dust that was already there at the origin of the work of art. The atomic people of the island whose dance merges with mythological compacts amongst the elements of nature. And of course, it is also an echo of Andreas's recovery of elemental justice. This island could have been, or rather should have been, a Miranda's brave new world. If only she had realized that she could have looked to the island itself rather than turn as she did to embrace the seeming outside, actually the old world, intruding into and closing down the true magic of the island. The world she returns to is the one she has already chosen on the island, a father and now a husband. In the Cheek by a Russian production of The Tempest, suddenly she realizes her mistake and trying to flee back to the island, she is forcibly removed from the island by the two of them, husband and father, each holding an arm and pulling her off her feet. You will recall that it is Caliban, who when guiding Stefano and Trunchio into the interior of the <coughs> island, having conspired with them to take it from Pospero, alerts them and us to the sonorous quality of the island, to sounds which are neither human nor under the magical control of Pospero, but are simply of the island, a kind of ever-present, already beyond and behind, everywhere still yet to come. We can imagine that it's in these sound signals, this music of the environment, this element that elemental justice is foretold and called into being, specifically in the echo of the gesture of withdrawal as we move towards. And, it's that's the, and in this echo of Andreas, for Andreas, and with thanks, respect, and love, that with Caliban, we remind ourselves, and others, be not afeared. The isle is still full, sorry, the isle is full of noises, sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. I mean, I can leave whenever I want. I can go outside. I just wanted to get a book here. No, but you can't leave because there is no outside. There is there is no outside. That's that's it. I mean, it's madness, yes. But 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 this this is the cry of the book. This is this is what Lindsay was saying. I mean, so the cry is spatialized. It's legalized, it's rarefied, it's embodied, it's ruptured, dissimilated, but underneath all of this, it remains a cry. A particularly echoing one, too, in the box of the Anthropocene, where humans are both everywhere and decentralized, in which all material bodies are clustered, breathing space is limited, the future is closing in, human extinction is a possible reality. <laughs> I just wanted to win. <laughs> Nonsense, I'm going now. <laughs>
an example of atmospheric dissimulation. Air is engineered atmospherically, made to look both visible and invisible, constructed as a distinction between interior and exterior. Atmosphere is all about partitioning, chopping up, dividing, closing up in bubbles. Atmosphere is breath, exhalation, ozone, earth. It is done, wool, grass. Desire, fear, death, sickness, loneliness, freedom, defiance. The doorscape allows a certain maneuvering space for the affective bodies, but an atmosphere has no such maneuvering space. Atmospheric air is asphyxiating. <coughs> the kind of air I'm tapping here is not a representation or metaphor, but a material reality. A material reality? Through and with this air. Atmospheric atmospheres are engineered. A play between interior and exterior, inclusion and exclusion, reality and dissimulation. When I first saw Bernini's Ecstasy of Santa, of Santa, <laughs> when I first saw Bernini's Ecstasy of Santa Teresa in the Church of Santa Maria della Vittoria in Rome, I was overwhelmed, not so much by the obviously orgasmic expression of the saint, obviously orgasmic, <laughs> but the something blatantly, it's, but it's, some, it, it's, it's something blatantly overlooked that the largest part of the statue is taken by the rising and falling, rising and falling, falling and refracting, right of the robes of the saint's robe. It is marble, but the marble is moving. It is captured, <laughs> but the captive is breathing. Our desire consists in moving, being moved endlessly, endlessly being moved. This continuous folding creates a new space, entirely baroque, yet still excessive, even for baroque aesthetic. The space of an absolute imminence of the manifold. This is the landscape where bodies cannot be differentiated from space.
I want to think of atmosphere as a force of attraction. Atmosphere is embodied by each body. It exceeds the body because it cannot be isolated. It is always collective and always withdrawn. An atmosphere spreads through and in between a multiplicity of bodies, like a sticky subject, substance. Atmosphere is the access of effect that keeps bodies together. And further, what emerges when bodies, human and non-human, are held together and against each other. But why is linguistic communication preferable to being touched or exposed to somebody else's odor? One cannot always control what one hears or smells, but one is expected to be able to control what one tastes. To find someone's touch or smell or even appearance disgusting is an, appearance, is an expression of a loss of control. But atmosphere, atmosphere is a rupture of air. Atmosphere severs and limits air in order to emerge. Air is placed in containers, characterized by an interplay between interior and exterior, closure and openness. So what kind of silence did you create here? What kind of atmosphere have you created? Just listen to it. Maybe close your eyes for a second and listen to it. How does it feel like? How does it taste? Can it be changed? Can I change it to something more lighthearted? <laughs> Can I change the taste to chocolate? <coughs> Maybe something like cake? Or poppy seed cake, which makes me hungry now. <laughs> Atmosphere is a manipulation of air and other bodies through rupture. But this might always, not always be a product of disciplinary presences. <coughs> On the one hand, air is full of opportunities, the large openness that Lusa Rigore has imagined, ready to be breathed in with future, available to be folded in the present amenable to mnemonic bottling of the past. On the other hand, however, air is given to control, manipulation, compulsive desiring, communal identities, and spatial partitioning. Air comes with property and fits snugly into rupturing partitions. Hmm. For these reasons, air is a manifest, air is a manifestation of the geological, political, legal, architectural, cultural, and so on. It's a paradox of continuum and rupture. But on account of its immensity, air is regularly delegated to the position of a hanging apple, just ready to be harvested. Air captured is knowledge opened up. Apple in hand and the garden blossoms to the etolated air of the exterior. But then no longer is there a garden and the earth becomes a shadeless surface. But the air, the air remains one. Hmm. I'm thinking of you as a hungry, <coughs> hungry flock. Hungry for a break from listening to all this. They think of poppy soup cake now, is it? Is it chocolate? Hmm. Immerse yourself. Imagine a large flock that goes on for as long as the eye can see. As many as 2,000 sheep flood the narrow valley. 
moving slowly like a woolly glacier, a carpet spread over the surface of the earth. There is nothing outside the ship. The earth is defined by their bodies. Amidst them, a shepherd, immersed, in some ways powerless, a master dominated by its own effective floorscaping. The strongest, most prominent effect here is hunger. Hunger is the alchemy that fuses the assembled shepherd flock in a continuous presence. It makes the ground move always forward and always in a singular direction of desire. You never turn back to the flock. Yet effects are not singular. They proliferate and vary according to the body that embodies them. This is the hunger of the sheep, but also the hunger of the consumer to be fed with the meat of the sheep. Both hungers are part of the assemblage. Well, writing this book certainly produced hunger. I mean, the author, he even thanks to all the coffee shops and the cake places that he went to in the process of writing this book. I mean, that's why we keep talking about cake and topics. <laughs> <laughs> The closeness between the shepherd and the animal, however, does not exhaust itself in the capitalist understanding of mass meat production. It goes further and predates it. Everything moves within immanence, but immanent is a but immanence is a continuum. It is static in its rush, immobile in its frenzy. Have a closer look at the flocks. On the first impression as as soon as the hunger is sated, the flock moves on. On closer inspection, the flock does not move. The flock is always there, a static immanence that hugs the earth. Shepherds and, his, and their flocks are static, unchanged, insulated, immanent. Their bodies, within an immanent atmosphere, participating in it whilst co-constructing. Shepherd, flock, space, time, make up, the, make up the imminence of the atmosphere. The atmosphere pulsates with tension, conflict, potential, of moving and stopping, of siding with and moving away from. Shepherd, flock, territory, seasons an assemblage of bodies enclosed in its imminent expanse, an immovable presence on the surface of the world, distilling and mapping the world according to its own atmospherics. So here we are assembled in our very own exclusive... Yes, yes, yes! But where is the law? There can be no justice that is not spatial. <laughs> yes? <laughs> Thank you enough. This was uh, this was just wonderful. Thank you so much for all of you for being here. Um, I need. I would like, to, if you allow me, just to thank a few people who obviously participated in this, and you've seen them, uh, but uh, some you haven't seen immediately. So may I start with Anish Popley, uh, our choreographer, uh, James Wilkie, and Roby Coley, our musicians, um, Yannicka Nanni and Maeve, Maeve McPhillips, our dancers. Uh, Rosvita Gerlitz and Anastasia Tatarin, our histrionic performers. Uh, I'd like to thank Victoria Gray Edwards for who's the, uh, the, the the faculty administrator for all her help, uh, and of course Roland Dunreuter, our dean, for happily hosting this. 
of course, the SSH, the School of Social Sciences and, uh, and the Law School. I really would like to also thank Colin Perrin, for, who's from R Routledge, our, our godsend prophet for everything that uh, legal literature uh, holds for the future. We're eternally indebted to him. And may I also, of course, um, thank our speakers, Linda Bremner, Peter Fitzpatrick, and Anne Bottomley. Uh, and of course, last but not least, uh, a constant source of inspiration and madness and uh, frustration and, and total love. And these were my students. <laughs> uh, just thank you very much. Enjoy the space.